Jerusalem. Four uh, quick readings this morning. Our title is Worship the Lord in the Beauty of Holiness. And First Chronicles 16, please. First Chronicles 16. We're only going to lift one verse. First Chronicles 16 and verse 29. Give unto the Lord glory due unto his name. Bring an offering. Come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. We bring an offering as it were this morning. The offering of the table of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The remembrance of him as we worship him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Second Chronicles, please, and chapter 20. I think your eye run down to verse 21. Second Chronicles 20, verse 21. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever next one will be in Psalm 29 please Psalm 29 let's just read the first two verses give on to the Lord O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And then Psalm 96, please. It's good to hear the leaves rustling. I don't mean the leaves outside on an autumn morning. I mean the leaves of your, your Bible turning over. Psalm 96, please. Let your eye run down to verse 9. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Let us pray. Father, we ask you that you would take your word and open it to our hearts and to our minds. Speak to us, Lord. Lord, you do as you deem it fit to do. Don't just be one of our number, but be the meeting. And Lord, we pray that not only be the meeting, Lord, that you would take charge and control of all things. We've been conscious as we sang on to you. We've been conscious that you're with us. And we now pray by thy spirit you would move upon us and deal with each and every one. We do love you because you first loved us. Remember those this morning who are on holiday, those who are ill and those who are mourning. Bless them, Lord. Give them their portion. Glorify your Son. For Jesus' name's sake we pray. Amen. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Our first reading of First Chronicles 16 and 29 our third reading of Psalm 29 and verse 2, our fourth reading of Psalm 96 and verse 9, all say, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Our second reading of Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 21 says we're to praise the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So it's similar to the other verses we read. But the beauty of holiness is expressed in all of these verses. I was on my phone during the week and I seen a really old, I don't know how old they were, but they were so old, a, a, an old man and an old woman. And they were in their living room and you could tell it was an old looking living room. And they were standing facing each other and the two of them started 
they were just gazing into each other's eyes and they were dancing as best they could with their age and frailty. And I looked at it and I thought, with the age and the years behind them, who knows what family they have behind them and all of the maybe two or three generations because they looked that, uh, that old. And I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was lovely. And there they were still, looked like they're in love with each other. And there they danced together in their living room, just very softly from side to side. And I thought that was beautiful. And this line dropped into my heart. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. You ever wonder what it means, the beauty of holiness? Those four words, the beauty of holiness. Well, we're going to look at it really this morning and we're going to, with God's help, we're going to try and help you with it because it means more than I thought. I just started reading it and then I'm going to give you my take on a few things. You don't have to take them, but I'm going to give you my take on a few things. We're going to look at When we say that we are to walk a life in holiness, we believe in holiness, what does that mean? You know, whenever you see a man or a woman and they're living before God, I'm not saying perfect, but living before God, there's something beautiful about it. There's something beautiful with even the way they respectfully dress. You know, uh, in a modern world where um, the vast majority of young women would dress, just about dress, thinking it's attractive. Well, there's something about a, a man and that's been in God's presence and how he, is, how he is dressed even. But a woman in dress and how she is dressed, but there's something that goes deeper than that. We're clothed with something different as a believer. And that is the beauty of holiness, clothed with this anointing that we receive, clothed with uh, something God gives us by being in his presence. You know, attitudes change when you're in God's presence. Even those people that you go to pray sometime, do you ever go to pray and the Lord brings someone up before you that has hurt you or you've fallen out with or you dislike or someone that you maybe even have bordered on hating. The Lord says, pray for them. I I, I don't want to pray for them. Pray for them. And the Lord won't let you go on any further until, Lord, will you bless them? And then the Lord says, you didn't mean it. Have you ever been there? But by the time you're finished, that spirit of, Aggression or hate or anger or even hurt can disappear because you're releasing them as it were and they have no more hold even over yourself and it helps us to move on in life. And there's something beautiful about that sort of a thing that when a man or a woman comes out of the presence of God, there's something different about them. You can't go into God's presence and come out the same way as you went in. There's something about the beauty of holiness and it's not our holiness. You know, we could be like the Pharisees, all geared up, looking the part, you know, with a Sunday suit on and have a rotten heart. You could be up behind a pulpit and you you treat your wife like a dog during the week. Or you have an angry, bitter spirit with your family and there's no pleasing you. That's not the beauty of holiness. Holiness isn't in a suit. Holiness is from the Lord in the heart. So what is it to worship the Lord in this beauty of holiness? Sister, is it because you would dress properly? Please, uh, we, we, we would advise that to, to do that. But would it be, well, that makes me holy or a man is holy for whatever reason? What, what makes someone holy? A woman could say, uh, I'm holy because I wear all the right gear from head to toe, but yet her heart, uh, uh, she has a, uh, she vibrates her husband. (laughs) What makes us holy? From the preacher to the pew, to the people. 
In these four verses, the phrase, the beauty of holiness is mentioned in all of our readings this morning. And the word for beauty in each of them is the word hadara, hadara. And it gives the idea, you're ready, of adornment, what we are adorned with. The high priest in Israel had to be specially adorned to be able to go into God's presence. And that was called beauty. How he was adorned with the the 12, the breastplate of judgment and the, the 12 precious stones with the names of the 12 tribes written in them. He had to be adorned in linen, white linen. And that on the outward appearance was the beauty of holiness for the high priest. So this word hadara means to uh, uh, have glory of an adornment. So what does that mean? And what we're going to look at in the Lord's will is God projects his glory to us and covers us in that when we're in his presence. You know, whenever I'm told, and I know there's nurses here, and I'm not sure midwives are here, but I'm told and I've read it up in different articles that when the male sperm touches the woman's egg and that is the joining for a baby to, be, to come out of this, I'm told there's a minute flash of light. And every time, and that's the life in, at, from the, the moment of conception, there's a flash of light. And it made me think of John chapter 1, verses 1, 2, 3, and then 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Now listen, Eurotychus, the Word is the seed. The Word is the seed to the heart of the man and the woman. The Word is the seed, the Spirit giving life through the Word to your heart and mine, and adorns us with a glory as it were, of humanity. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. From that spark, here is the light of men, mankind. And that starts to grow in the womb. That is the life from God. Hence why we are opposed to abortion, of course. But it happens spiritually when a man and a woman are saved. The word of God and the spirit entering the heart here is that it's like the, the egg. It's, it can produce nothing without the word. Now, the word word in some of occasions in the Greek is the word sperma. It's the same. And it means to enter in, to bring life changes us, gives us new ideas, new thoughts, new, new loves, and that which we used to love, we hate, not what, what we used to hate, we love, changes us completely, adorns us with something different than the world. Sometimes we, as it were, lose that for the simple reason is because of our attitudes and because of our ways and our stinking thinking, and you can go on with those sort of ways to describe it. So this word hadara, used in the four verses, each and every one of it means to, uh, the, gives the idea of the glory of adornment and it also means to give honour in a place of public worship. So the spark of life that we have coming into the presence of God in public worship together, what do we do? We are coming in the beauty of this life that God has given us. Not only our life from conception in the womb, but our life in Christ. And we're coming in that life to worship him, to thank him. Sure, many of us know we've got a, I've got a new prayer partner in training, um, a wee pup. And... He's, a t- he's just a set of teeth with legs. That's all he is. 
He's at everything. I mean, everything. So we're up early and Alison would take him out or I would take him out. And I was in the shower and Alison took him out the back, waving and clothes back. And I came down then and I was dressed. And usually I'm dressing up before anyone, but he, she had to get up because he was wanting out. And I was out the back and I was just looking over the fields. You know what I said? I said, Lord, how, how, how would you have me come and worship you? Overlooking fields out the back. Beautiful green fields. And there's a wall about this height and a stood leaning on it with a dog running around. He says, Lord, how would you have me to come and worship you? I want to thank you, Lord, that I have health. I have strength this morning. That I am blessed this morning to be able to gather with your people in public worship. There are people that start to think of those who are in hospital who would love to be here or wherever they worship, who would love to join with you this morning, but they can't. Thought of those who then could have, but didn't. And I thought, Lord, why would people be so easily put off your presence in public worship? Where's the beauty in all of this? So here's the thing, and it's, it's not a condemnation, it's a question. Did you worship this morning? Did you worship this morning? So this word, hotara for beauty, it's used a fifth time, which we didn't read this morning. And it's in Proverbs 14 and 28. I've written it down. I'm going to say, just for time's sake, it says, in the multitude of people is the king's honor, but in the want of people is destruction. Now you might say, where is hot or raw for beauty there? It's the word honor, honor. In other words, this gives the idea of an earthly idea, what people of earth think beauty is. Is beauty one of these glossy magazines where you see them all on the front of glossy magazines or whatever? I couldn't tell you the name of them, but you know which ones I mean. Everything's false. They're airbrushed. And young women and young men think they have to look like that to be beautiful. But they're airbrushed. There's uh, false eyelashes. <laughs> I, I'm going to try them. I don't know what this word really is, but the, there's false eyelashes. There's Botox. You know, some of them, if the, if the, if the smile, you wouldn't know the difference whether they're smiling or not. Some of them look like the Joker. There's even a lady preacher looks like the Joker preacher. You know who I'm talking about. Just looks like they destroyed herself to make herself look good. That's not beauty. Young men can do the same. This, this word here for honor, hot or raw, is used in a sense a negativity. And it can be used negatively. So for example here, uh, in the multitude of people is the king's honor. And, he's, and the idea here is the king is saying, the more I have, the more subjects I have, the more people under me, the more riches I can accumulate. What does he say? Makes me big and beautiful. Because I get the honor of it. And it's, it's an earthly thing. <coughs> Wanting to have that earthly so-called beauty. And in many times, in many ways, the earthly beauty is not beautiful at all. Sometimes we look at things, and I like to look at architecture, and you know, I think modern architecture is like something you made up in primary school. But you look at the older buildings, and they're beautiful how they were done. They don't seem to do them anymore like that. But this word here is, it's, it's earthly, and it's the, it's carnal way of thinking of what beauty really is. This gives the idea of beauty and honor from a worldly, humanistic way of looking at it, from a human viewpoint. In other words, a king's honor is found in the multitude of people he rules over. And the monarch 
is adorned with power and authority, with much wealth and jewels, crowned with diamonds, set in shoulders of gold. And he says, this is honor or this is, this makes me beautiful. This is hadarah, is the same word for worship the Lord and the beauty of holiness. And none of it, absolutely none of it, impresses God. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Kings chapter 4. First Kings chapter 4, please. Here's what I want you to see this morning. I'm going to show you the outward adorning of beauty and then the inward adorning of beauty. Let your eye run down for time's sake to verse 20. 1 Kings 4 verse 20. Judah and Israel were many as the sand which is by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and making merry. And Solomon reigned over all kingdoms of the river unto the land of the Philistines. That's where you hear from the river to the sea. Solomon reigned it. Unto the border of Egypt they brought presents and served Solomon all the days of his life. And Solomon's provision for one day was 30 measures of fine flour, three score measures of meal, 10 fat oxen and 20 oxen out of the pastures and 100 sheep beside hearts and roebucks and fallow deer and fat and fatted up fowl. For he had dominion over all the region on this side of the river from Tifsa to Azza over the king, over all, king, all the kings on the side of the river and he had peace on all sides round about him. Now take notice of this, if you will. Judah and Israel, verse 25, dwelt safely, every man under his vine, every and under his fig tree, from Dan unto Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. These, this is before the split, but these are the two regions. You ready? And Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots, 12,000 horsemen, and those officers provided victuals for the king of King Solomon, and for all that came unto King Solomon's table, every man in his month, they lacked nothing. Barley also, and straw for the horses, and dromedaries brought they unto the place where the officers were, every man according to his charge. What do we have here is if you want the hot or raw, the beauty of outward expression of all that Solomon had. Now you go and you were to see Solomon's kingdom was like no other kingdom. It was greater and higher and bigger, more blessed than any kingdom. And listen, there was nothing wrong with that because God blessed him. God told him how to be blessed, but it changes. We look at the, the real beauty from verse 29. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezraite, and Heman, and Calcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahal. And his fame was in all nations round about. And he spake 3,000 proverbs. And his songs were 1,005. And he spake of trees from the cedar of Lebanon, that is in Lebanon, even unto the hyssop that bringeth, springeth out of the wall. He spaketh also of beasts and of fowl and of creeping things and of fishes. And there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from the kings of the earth, which he had of his, which had heard, pardon me, of his wisdom. That's the inward beauty of Solomon. They came to hear, and then they saw the outward manifestation of what was in Solomon's heart, the wisdom. Remember, God says, what will you that I give you? And he says, give me wisdom that I may go out and, and in before this people. But then it changes. You see, in We'll not flick to it, but in Deuteronomy chapter 28, the Lord told Moses, he says, look, if my people don't follow me, then they're going to be in trouble. There's, their, blessing will, their blessing will start to diminish. I'm, I'm paraphrasing this. And all those nations will come in against them. 
You're seeing that in our land today because we've moved away from God. But by the time you get to 1 Kings 11, just go to 1 Kings chapter 11, please, and verse 1. But Solomon loved many strange women. That means many women who were not Israelites. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and the Hittites. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods, and Solomon clave unto these in love. Now you read on the chapter in the chapter 12, and this is when the Judah and Israel, which were in peace together under Solomon's united kingdom, you find it's then they are separated through the trouble that this brings. So you can see how Solomon's inward beauty started to be affected by the gods of all of those nations and others that we haven't read of the Egyptians and the Zidonians and the Ammonites and so on. And you'll be able to read. And that's how, as it were, as Christians, the world affects us. And we start to lose that beauty. You know, Alison and I were out on Friday. We went to see the porters. Then I had to go to Carrick Fergus to see the accountant and came from there on the way down. And uh, we stopped for a wee quick Indian. It's my favourite Indians out there. On the way back, we stopped from my favourite Indian, had a quick bite to eat. And on the way down, there was a, an accident and a lady was killed and we didn't want to get into the traffic. We walked into the Abbey Centre and ran it for a half an hour to try, to try and let the traffic die down. And as I'm walking by, there was a girl that we knew. She used to be serving the Lord, singing in the choir in Whitewell and she used to be really witnessing for God and she slowly allowed things of the world to come in and she started to lose that Beauty of the Lord. Started to lose it. You see, your attitude changes. Your temperaments change. And that's because you've, you've missed out from the beauty of the Lord in the sense where you haven't been there with Him the way you once were. You haven't spent that time with him the way you once were. And the, the, the gods are like Solomon, the gods of his wives, the so-called gods. In other words, those spirits started to affect him. And he, with all of this wisdom, what happened to him? But it ends up, he sins so much, his kingdom collapses. And this is the problem when people are so far away from God because we allow whatever it may be, Whatever we spoke of earlier that you go to pray about and pray for and all of that sort of stuff, all of that starts to affect our mind. It gets into our very being. And we start to either dislike or hate or, you know, we just don't want to be there anymore. And all of this stuff, we hold on to bitterness. And, and you know, when you're holding on to bitterness, you know it does you more harm than it does the person you're bitter about. Holding on to bitterness is like you drinking a cup of poison and expecting the other person to die. Think about this. And all of these things affect the human being, affect our hearts, affect our walk with God. And we start to lose our beauty of the Lord. And this person we've seen Basically, I know that she's seen us, but she's been away from the Lord for a long time. She was talking and more or less just kept her head like this. And you know, you can go and you try and reach people who once walked with the Lord and were touched by the Lord and experienced that lovely presence of the Lord and the beauty of the Lord. And, and suddenly as things come in, it starts to, it starts to affect them until they find themselves far away from God. And the beauty of holiness no longer reflects from them. You know, there's nothing as sad, tragic, 
It said, it said it's beautiful to watch an ocean liner sail at night across a calm sea. And the lights are on. But it says there's nothing as tragic as seeing a rough sea with that ocean liner trying to stay afloat with the sea inside the liner. And this is what has happened with many people. The world and the pull of the world and the draw of the world and, and then the ones who have hurt us and holding on to it and we get angry and bitter. And I'm not speaking about anyone here in particular, so don't think, but if the Lord speaks to us, we need to take it on board. What are you saying to me, Lord? There's nothing as bad as seeing a person who once loved the Lord Jesus Christ and now they've lost that beauty. It's far from them. It's like that man and that woman looking into each other's eyes, even though they were, I mean, they could hardly stand, they were so old. And I'm not usually that, you know, I, I'm not usually that soft. In fact, I think I am getting soft. I'll be honest, Alison says I'm soft now because, you know, After, after my, my, my old mate passing away, my prayer partner, Hardy, I was like, never again, never again, no. And they were at me and I got this wee pup and she came in the order, the order in the middle of the night and there's me laying with him, hugging him in the land, land on the settee, <laughs> sleeping with him. So maybe I'm getting soft. But I watched this and it's like, remember the times in the spirit you used to gaze as it were into the very presence of the eyes, as it were, of Christ. That all that you've seen in the scriptures was the beauty of him, but then the soreness came and something has happened. And we can all go through those times. It's not a condemnation. And that beauty of the Lord were a beautiful woman in God, a beautiful brother in the Lord. It seems as if that garment of, of, of projection and reflection of beauty is gone. There's nothing as sad as, and nothing as tragic to see that. When we look at Solomon, we see the humanistic, wow, look what Solomon had. But it was God's beauty in him that attracted people to him. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 27, the Lord Jesus said, consider the lilies, how they grow they toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Notice Solomon, all his glory wasn't even as beautiful, so to speak, as a wee lily growing in a field. The term for lily in the Greek text is a kregnon. Why don't you, why don't you stay with me? Because time is already gone. Notice this. Go with me, or you can just listen if you'd like to. Go with me to 1 Kings chapter 7. You should be still there, maybe. Here's what I want you to notice. Let your eye run down to verse 19, just for time's sake. And the chapters that were upon the top of the pillars were of lily work in the porch for cubits. Notice, lily work, four cubits. Now you see, the word there for lily is the word shushan. That's in the Hebrew text, it's shushan. And, and I'm telling you this because it means something. It gives the idea of being tubular, trumpet-like. Uh, that sort of a shape and more likely white in color, like a white lily. And you had the big pillars in Solomon's temple. Then you had on top of it, these ornate surroundings with what looked like lilies. Now bear with me here because in all honesty, I, I didn't read this anywhere. I was praying about it and I felt the Lord showed me this and I got up in my study and I was going to do somersaults over my table only I knew I'd get a bad back and I wouldn't be able to make it this morning. I'm too old for it now. These lilies, the Shushan, in Psalm 45 and in verse one, it starts like this. To the chief musician 
Shushanim. The sons of Korah must kill the song of loves. I think it was last week or the week before, maybe I had mentioned that Shushanim means the lilies. And I, it never dawned on me until this week. And I went, hold on a second. And I correlated these two words and looked them up. And this Shushanim, they're saying, they think this means lily. And then when I was reading here of 1 Kings 7 and 19, uh, the chapters that were on the top of the pillars were of lily work. I looked up the word Shushan. So it means lily. And when the Lord is saying to come into his presence because there, there's a beauty that adorns the place. There's a beauty that adorns the person greater than the very temple itself. The Lord Jesus said in Matthew 12 and verse six, but I say unto you, to the Jews, that in this place is one greater than the temple. So they were walking in beneath the lilies to praise God, to worship. They were walking in with this adornment, as it were, thinking this is pleasing. It was at the time appeasing God. But now Jesus comes and says, the one here who is the lily himself, I'm greater than the temple. The lily is greater than Solomon. There's more beauty in the little lily than there was in all of Solomon's kingdom, but you're too fixed and focused on that little bit. And brothers and sisters, when this hit me, I thought, Lord, when we come in to praise you, so to speak, we're coming in through the lily of the valley. We're coming in from the, through the Lord Jesus Christ. We're coming in with a greater, more splendid, glorious beauty than anyone could ever find anywhere. Greater than Solomon. And there he, as it were, projects his beauty. What do you mean projects his beauty? Well, let me tell you something then, because time is gone. You may let the children know that they can come in, please. Let me show you this before the children come in. For example, in Matthew chapter 17 and verse two, the Lord Jesus takes Peter, James and John up the mount and he is transfigured before them and it says of the Lord Jesus, it was transfigured before them. Notice, and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was as white as light. He projected the brilliance. He projected the beauty of his own being. But when you go to Exodus chapter 34 and verse 29, Moses is up Mount Sinai and it says, and it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. He's up the mount, he comes down and his face is shining, reflecting the beauty of Christ, reflecting the beauty of the Lord. And so you see, the Lord Jesus projects from within. He's almighty God, veiled in flesh. Projects on the Mount of Transfiguration the deity of glorious beauty that's in him. But Moses in his presence up the mount, he receives it in his presence and comes down, doesn't even realise that his face is shining and has to veil his face. And so brothers and sisters, when I seen this, I thought, Lord, how wonderful are you that no matter how I am, no matter what I have been, Lord, that your great love and mercy and grace allows me to come into your presence. As it were, we are the temple adorned with the lily. We are the temple of God and your presence ref shines onto me and reflects. So when I leave his presence, I'm different. When I leave his presence, I'm changed. When I leave God's presence, I'm better. Brothers and sisters, I've just touched the surface of that. I'll maybe do a part two. Pastor Michael will be here. I, I, I made this with him weeks ago and I forgot it was this week. So 
He'll be here next Sunday morning. But here's the thing, brothers and sisters. When was the last time you went in and prayed about it? But then when's the last time you went in and prayed for them? Because that will change you. When's the last time you spent time in the presence of the Lord, reading his word and then praying? And do you ever sing to the Lord? Look, you have heard me singing, you know. It's a good job I have no embarrassment. I just sing anyway. But here's the thing. When was the last time you went into God's presence and sang? Open a hymn book, a chorus book. Sing. Sing before him, open it up and sing on to him. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh. Maybe be busy, even for a few minutes. Get on your knees before him. Lord, Lord, I love you. And Jesus, I worship you. Thank you for all you've done for me. Ask him to fill you and baptize you in the Holy Ghost. Open your heart to him. Love him. Just love him. Don't ask him for anything. Let him show you what you have to pray for. You do it this afternoon. And by the time you come out, I tell you, if you go in and you do as the Spirit leads you in prayer, you'll come out changed you'll come out a different person. God bless us this morning.